Good afternoon, everybody. This is Michael Munson with FORGE, and I'm joined today with FORGE's Program and Policy Director, Larry Cook-Daniels. And as you may have just heard, um, my office is testing the fire alarms right now, so Larry may need to take over for uh, part of the audio. The topic of today's November 2012 webinar is the intersection of sex work and violence, particularly in relationship to transgender people. We have about 90 minutes today to explore the subject, and we hope to leave room at the end for some questions and comments. For those of you who are, who are joining us for the first time, welcome. Um, we're glad to have you here. And for those of us uh, who are joining us again, thanks for coming back and, and being part participating in this webinar. Just a quick reminder, we won't be covering any Trans 101 materials in today's call, but if you'd like to learn more, you can go to our website and we have archived Trans 101 webinars that are available. Okay. Sorry for the pause. Um, the fire alarm just got finished, um, so hopefully we won't have any more interruptions. Um, so a, a couple of things other than the fire alarm potential warning is that today's time is going to be a little bit less interactive than some of the webinars that we've done because we have so much material to cover. Um, I do want to let people know that we'll send out the PowerPoints when we're done with the webinar so that people can have them and um, you don't need to take as many notes if, if that's more comfortable for folks. So we are really grateful for the Office on Violence Against Women for their help in um, bringing these webinars to you for free. Um, we can't do that without um, their support, so we're very, very appreciative of that. Let me just start out a little bit with what we have to offer you, what FORGE can do for you. We realize that um, sometimes we don't, don't cover this, and, and people wonder what we can, can do for you all. So the quick summary is that we offer providers training and technical assistance, and that can look like a lot of different things. We offer a lot of one-on-one -on -one support to so people that call us or email us. We can dire directly respond to your requests and hopefully find you a solution that works for you and your client or clients. We offer these monthly webinars that are free and available to anybody in your office or, or anyone else. Um, so we're really glad to be able to do that every month. We offer trainings which are at conferences or um, by specific request. We also have a website that's full of publications that you can check out at your convenience. We also offer specific support for transgender survivors. And I mention that because a lot of providers want to know what to do and how to how to help how to best help their transgender survivors. So we offer listserv support so that transgender survivors and um, significant others, friends, family, and allies, or SAFAs, can find support at any point in time, so 24 hours a day. We also offer referrals to trans survivors so that they can find people who are trans savvy in their in their area and people who are also trauma informed. We can't always um, mesh people with the perfect referrals, but we try to get them to somebody who's going to not re-victimize or re-traumatize them. Um, we're also connected with a lot of other organizations which have better resources in their area. One of the things that we're really glad to be able to offer again is a writing to heal group. We find that a lot of times trans survivors can't access group support in their areas because those groups are gender segregated or sex segregated. So the Ready to Heal group offers both an alternative way for healing and a way that trans survivors can access the support that they need in a safe environment and in a trans-informed and trauma-informed environment. So the next groups will be starting sometime early in 2013. So a couple of pieces of housekeeping. Um, any webinar focused on violence can be different, difficult to listen to. So please take care of yourself. And if um, this webinar is being recorded, so if you need to step out to take care of yourself, you can always come back and listen to it online later. And I wanted to say for this webinar that the content is somewhat sexually explicit because we're talking about sex work. So hopefully that will not be a problem for most people, but I just wanted to put that out there up front that we will be talking a little bit about sex and about sex work, and the language might be explicit, but it certainly won't be vulgar, and, and again, hopefully it will not be offensive. 
So here's a little bit about what we're going to do, the overview of what we're going to do today. Um, Laurie and I are going to talk a little bit about data and framework of, of how we kind of look at where we get to and how we get to the point of um, having trans people in sex work environments. And then the majority of the time is going to be a, an interview with Claudine O'Leary. And we ended up having to pre-record this for some technical reasons, so we just did it uh, the other night. And she's a really engaging and dynamic speaker who has a wealth of knowledge about both trans people and people in the sex trade. So that will be the majority of our time today. And then after that, we're going to talk a little bit about resources and then have some time for questions and comments. So very briefly, the, the data sources that we'll be drawing from today are from three main sources. One is the National Center for Transgender Equality. They, in 2011, had a very large survey of over 6,400 respondents. And it's a very interesting survey, which I encourage people to look at the, the, in its entirety. The second data source is the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs, Forge is a member organization of, of NCAVP. They produce every year an annual hate crimes report. And then the third data source is multiple surveys that Forge has done. So we've got some, some data from 2011 in particular that we're going to be sharing today. And Laurie, if you're able to um, take over a little bit. I hear an echo, and that probably is distracting for folks. Yes, if I remember to unmute. The fact that so many transgender people engage in survival sex work, or to an even greater degree, are profiled as sex workers, creates complications for transgender people who are sexually assaulted or experience other forms of violence. As one person explained about the response to transgender sexual assault victims, the police would just say we got what we deserved, or worse, for some of the African-American trans women in our area, arrest them for prostitution. Let's start with some general statistics first. Much of the data on the next few slides is from the National Center for Transgender Equality's 2011 study, Injustice at Every Turn. We often use data from this study for several reasons. First, it is one of the largest studies of transgender people. Over 6,400 6, people participated. And second, they did extensive outreach and sampling to ensure that the research included as many diverse populations within the trans community as possible. As you can see on this slide, only 1% of the non-transgender women in the United States have engaged in sex for money. We do not have rates for non-trans men. From this sample of 6,400 transgender and gender non-conforming people, 11% were reported working in the sex trade at some point in time. When we look at the data by race, we can see that the rates almost triple for those who are Latino or Latina and are four times as high for people who are African American. We'll talk more about how race and other demographics play a role in prevalence as we go through the webinar today. Another overview statistic is the ratio of how many people who are male to female or people who are on the trans-feminine spectrum versus F to M, those on the trans-masculine trans spectrum, who report having done sex work for income or survival needs. The circles on the screen indicate that twice as many trans women, 15%, have worked in the sex trade as trans men at 7%. We do not have specific data on how many individuals who identify as a gender other than male or female, trans men or trans women, may work in the sex trade. In general, more trans women of color are working in the sex trade than other populations within the trans community. However, it is important to remember that trans people of all gender vectors engage in sex work. In every FORGE webinar or in-person training, we include images of trans people and loved ones. We have their overt permission to use their images in our trainings, and we are very grateful for their willingness to enhance our educational material. We include images to help people literally put a face on who trans people are. We know some providers and professionals believe they may have never met a trans person or may have a predefined idea of who they think trans people are. Hopefully the images 
you see here today will help us all remember the diversity and resilience of trans people. The individuals pictures, pictured may or may not have done sex work. Let's wind back time and look at some data that helps show some of the reasons why so many trans people may end up engaging in sex for money or for other survival needs. Starting, excuse me, starting from the right side of this slide, 78% of students in grades kindergarten through 12th grade reported experiencing harassment due to their trans identity or gender nonconformity. As you can see, 31% noted that the harassment was from teachers. In each of these categories, you can see that adults and teachers, as well as other students, are causing trans and gender nonconforming youth harm. 35% reported being physically assaulted at school, including 5% from teachers. 12% reported experiencing sexual violence at school, including 3% from teachers. This is from Injustice at Every Turn. This quote highlights some of the correlations of what happens when young people experience violence at school. Those respondents who said they were physically assaulted at school due to gender identity or expression were twice as likely, 32% compared to 14% of those who had not been assaulted in school, to have done sex work and other work in the underground economy, and were 50% more likely to be incarcerated. As you might guess, for students who experience sexual assault, physical assault, harassment, and much more while at school, in addition to what may be happening in their lives outside of the school setting, staying in school can be difficult. Six percent of trans students were expelled due to bias, and 15 percent reported leaving school due to harassment or violence. What that means is that up to 21 percent of trans and gender nonconforming youth never return to high school and never acquire a high school diploma. Leaving school prior to graduation can set up a series of events that lead to less than positive outcomes. Often, these young people are not welcome in their homes, and they quickly end up on the streets, struggling to survive. Injustice at every turn reported that 39% of youth who left school because harassment was so bad turned to sex work or other work in the underground economy. However, others have noted that within 48 hours after a young person is on the streets, 100% will engage in at least one form of illegal activity to meet their survival needs. That could be stealing food or money, squatting, meaning sleeping or staying in someone else's property, trading sex for money or shelter or food, or selling or trading drugs to meet their basic needs. Although young people and those without a high school diploma have higher rates of involvement in the sex trade, those with college degrees or postgraduate degrees also engage in sex work. This chart indicates that 33% of trans people without a high school diploma have worked in the sex trade, and 7% of those with college degrees have done so as well. 6% of those who have completed graduate school have exchanged sex for money or housing. It is no surprise that when high numbers of trans people are not finishing high school, they may have difficulties accessing mainstream employment. Even those who are able to complete high school or go on to college frequently experience job discrimination, employment disparities, underemployment, or other issues related to working in more traditional jobs. Trans people are twice as likely to be unemployed than the general U.S. population and are four times more likely than the general population to have a household income of less than $10,000. It is fairly easy to see how people who are unemployed or who are living below the poverty line would find other ways of accessing income and basic survival needs. One of the many challenges trans people face when trying to enter or stay in the mainstream work environment is what kind of documentation they have. Even if someone has graduated from high school or finished a GED program, they may still face a barrier if they do not have up 
updated name and gender on their identification. All jobs ask for ID, and when there is a mismatch, it automatically outs a person as trans, which may lead to not being hired. Note, when we talk about identification and documentation, there is often an assumption that a person has transitioned from one gender to another. Of course, this is not always what is desired or possible. Many individuals do not wish, want to transition, but rather prefer a more gender neutral or androgynous identity and expression. Others may have a host of other reasons why they do not wish to transition. Only 21% of trans people who have tra transitioned have changed all of their identification and records. This is, by the way, quite a difficult task, changing all documentation since some states or agencies don't allow changes of name or gender, or only do so after very stringent requirements are met. On the other end of the spectrum, 33% of trans people who have transitioned have changed none of their IDs or records. This is sometimes due to finances, lack of knowledge about how to access systems, systemic barriers, or many other reasons. A side note is that 41% of people who have transitioned have not updated their driver's licenses or state ID cards. We add this specific statistic since this is the form of identification that most people are asked to show at job interviews, at police stops, at banks, or at many other locations in order to prove who they are. Not having some or most identification changed can create substantial employment barriers as well as cause hardships if stopped by the police, either for a routine traffic stop or if the victim of a crime. Here is one story of the implica implications of having non-matching documentation. One assault was in an emergency room at a hospital by a female doctor who I believe was angered by my appearance. I looked male, and my hospital bracelet and chart said female. Although laws are changing in more and more states, and even the federal government, are adding non-discrimination laws and policies, transgender and gender non-conforming people are still being fired or not hired or promoted at alarmingly high rates. 26% of trans and gender non-conforming individuals report being fired because they are transgender. Additionally, 47% report that they were not not hired or were denied promotion because they are transgender or gender nonconforming. Since discrimination in the workplace is so prevalent, many trans people are not able to stay very long at one job or may need to supplement their employment with other work or other sources of income. For those who are not fired from their jobs, many experience hostile work environments. For example, 14% of those who have transitioned have been denied the use of the bathroom that aligns with their gender. They may be asked to use restroom, restrooms on another floor of the office or even in another building. They may also be asked to use a bathroom that is not in line with their presenting gender or even their legal gender. Similarly, trans people are often asked inappropriate questions. In this survey, 41% have been asked inappropriate, invasive, or prying questions about their transgender identity or experience, or about their surgical status. Many times, people think they have a right to ask personal questions, for example, about a trans person's genitals or surgical status, without realizing how inappropriate it would be if someone asked them the non-trans person, questions about their genitals or what types of surgery they have had. Most of us tend to think of sex work as something that younger people do. However, people of all ages, genders, sizes, and shapes can and do work in the sex trade. This quote is from a 2008 Ford survey on transgender elder abuse. I prostitute myself at age 55 because even though I'm a post-op and passable, no one passes 100% of the time. No one. Job discrimination is bad because you're stuck with fellow employees eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. That much harassment is bad for one's mental health. Trans people in general have substantially higher rates of suicide attempts than non-trans people. In the US, 
the rate of suicide attempts is 1.6%. 1.6% is barely visible on the chart on the screen. When we look at the trans community, the rate of suicide attempts jumps to an astounding 41%. We won't go into some of the possible reasons why this rate is so much higher during this webinar, but I'm sure many of you can speculate. When people who are transgender or gender nonconforming and who have been involved with sex work at some point in their lives were asked about their suicidality, 60% responded that they had attempted suicide. This rate is 37 times higher than the general population at 1.6%. It is no surprise that HIV rates are higher within populations who engage in sex work. The more potential risk behaviors a person engages in, the more likely they are to become infected with HIV. The U.S. population as a whole has an HIV positive rate of 0.6%. The general trans population has a rate four times higher at 2.6%. For trans sex workers, or those who have previously engaged in the sex trade, the rate skyrockets to 15.32%, or 25 times higher than the general population. There are also, also other disparities, such as African American trans women having higher rates of HIV infection than other subpopulations. Sub those without a high school diploma or whose income is below 10,000 are also more likely to be HIV positive. We're going to turn next to an interview with Claudine O'Leary. Our original intent was to have her here with us today. Unfortunately, we needed to record the segment with her earlier this week. Claudine O'Leary is an advocate for young people involved in trading sex or being sexual for money, gifts, drugs, or survival needs. She works together with youth in the sex trade to understand youth involvement, create more options for youth, and organize for social justice. She also educates adults on how to effectively and respectfully support youth and adults who've been trafficked, sexually exploited, or somehow involved in the sex trade. We are grateful that Claudine has been so engaged and able to share her knowledge with us. I will note that um, we were not able to um, handle the voice levels of this video in quite as well as we wanted to, so you may need to adjust your volume control as we go through it. This will be a video of Claudine being interviewed by Michael Munson. Michael? Hi, Claudine. It's really nice to have you joining us today. Um, I'm wondering if you can start by just telling us a little bit about how you came to this work. Uh, you know, I've been involved in working with young people who are involved in training sex for money, gifts, drugs, or survival needs for over 20 years now. And part of that, even just starting out as a teen, I was supporting my friends and looking for support to myself. And I think as soon as I was able to find organizations to be able to work with, I did that. did that in a lot of different communities. I'm originally from Chicago. And you know, worked as volunteers and worked to be able to support the work of other organizations. But I've done a lot of different things, and that includes even starting my own organization in Chicago. But now I'm actually living in Milwaukee, and I try to support lots and lots of different organizations to be able to improve their work um, with individuals who are somehow involved in the sex trade. Um, I guess I just want to put out there, too, is that I, you know, We've been doing this work for, I've been doing this work for so long in all these different kinds of ways. People find out, like, say, like, how did you even find out to be able how to do that work? Um, so much of this work is kind of like we share this amongst each other, you know. There isn't, like, a, a place where you go necessarily to learn everything. You learn through connections and through individuals and through people. And so I know that a lot of the things that we're going to talk about um, today, I actually have definitely gotten schooled by a lot of my friends and colleagues, and so I'm especially indebted to organizations like HIPS, which is in Washington, D.C. There are a number of organizations that have impacted my work, and especially even just the writings and work of Emi Kuyama, who have, I think uh, has just done exceptional work around this issue. So I, I hope to be able to um, add some, some of that information, but I have definitely learned so much from so many different people um, over the years. 
Excellent. That's really a, a great kind of segue, too, into what we're going to talk next about, which is kind of, you know, what is the scope of sex work? What do we, what do we mean when we talk about um, people that are in the sex trade? And, and we have, I think a lot of times we have one limited view of, of what we think that is. So can you talk a little bit about what kind of falls under the broad umbrella of sex work? You know, there's so many different kinds of ways when we think about sexual labor, when we think about all the different kinds of ways that people can use um, sex or sexual means in order to be able to get by. I think sometimes perhaps as individuals in different kinds of lines of work, you might end up, say, for example, only running into individuals who are involved in street-based work, right? Street-based prostitution, trading sex for money, and finding people on the street. But we know from research that that's usually only about 10 to 15 percent of any community's um, sex trade, right? The exchange of sex or um, sexual type stuff in exchange for money, gifts, drugs, or survival needs. So that happens in many, many different places, not just on the street. That means that we're talking about both legal ways, uh, for example, by doing adult videos and adult films or webcam shows, um, to working at different kinds of strip clubs or exotic dancing and working clubs and parties or even for individuals. That can be a part of that. And then there are things that, for example, maybe it's kind of like hard to say whether or not some, might, some of it might count as legal depending on where you're at, and some of it may not be, but people might advertise doing things like, say, erotic massage or um, different kinds of fetish work, like, say, for example, um, if we're talking about, like, BDSM or other kinds of um, fetishes, and that can even include, like, say, for example, selling different kinds of clothing items that were worn by you, and, you know, those are, are ways that people will pay for those items, and that's kind of like a part of sex work as well. Um, when we talk about, like, even just finding individuals who are willing to pay for sex, that can be people who we find online. It can be people who we actually just kind of know in the neighborhood, somebody who's around. Um, so when you think about, like, in-call, so typically you hear about terms like in-call or out-call or escort, um, that can happen at people's houses. That can, people, it can happen at hotels, at offices, at parties, all of these different kinds of places where you end up meeting people who are willing to pay for sex. Um, again, that kind of like informal exchanges can even happen within relationships. So it isn't necessarily about like finding like individuals who you don't know. It's like having a sugar daddy or a sugar mommy, somebody who's kind of in a more relationship context supporting you and giving you money, and you're not necessarily exchanging sex on a per sex act basis. You are kind of have like a relationship with an uh, individual or a number of individuals, and that's a way of being able to do sex work sometimes too. So I think there's lots and lots of different ways, and some of it is individuals who are getting involved um, through choice. They're, like, making a decision, like, these are a number of different options, and this is the best option for me right there. Sometimes it's about circumstance um, in the sense that we might have limited options, and this is the best option out of those limited options. And sometimes it's about coercion, and coercion can happen in a number of different kinds of ways. That includes even when when you think about like survival sex for basic needs. This term actually kind of got started through a lot of youth workers who found that when they talk with youth, they'd say, well, you know, sex for money, and maybe they'd call it prostitution or another kind of term, and people would say, whoa, it's not prostitution, I'm not doing prostitution, feel more comfortable with like a term like survival sex to kind of capture that informal kinds of sexual exchanges for a place to stay or for some food or access to a shower. Those are the other kinds of ways that survival sex can mean so many different kinds of things because it includes not just like those immediate needs, but when you talk about it, it can be about safety. It can be about access to medical care or you're stranded and somebody's going to give you a ride in exchange for some kind of like a, a sexual thing. So when we think about like all those different survival sex, it's not just about youth. Um, there's also many adults who are involved in survival sex. When you think about the fact that if you're in a really tough situation, so coercion can mean about that in the sense of like economic coercion, but then there's also about physical coercion or force. Um, this is where sometimes people might have heard of the term human trafficking and think about like, well, how does that connect up? Is, it, is that something separate? And the challenge within that right now, and it's kind of a much bigger kind of conversation, but to say briefly, human trafficking, according right now to both federal and a lot of state laws, talks about the idea that if somebody gets involved in forced labor, whether that's labor for farm labor, 
um, factory labor, domestic labor, or sexual labor, um, and they're there as an, if they're as an adult, if they're 18 and over, through force, fraud, or coercion. And force, again, can mean all kinds of different ways. Coercion and fraud, if you want to think about like somebody lying to you, somebody not telling you the whole story, um, that that is considered to be human trafficking. And if you have somebody who is a minor, somebody who is under the age of 18, um, according to federal law, they're saying that that person is automatically, if they're at all involved in the commercial sex act, considered to be um, having been human, having been trafficked, a victim of human trafficking. So that's a part of how this is connected, which means that in all of those different ways that we talked about, um, whether it be like adult videos, whether it be exotic dancing, whether it be escort or in-call or, in in -call or out call, erotic massage, um, street-based work, working a track, working a stroll, um, all of these different kinds of ways, including even some of what might be considered to be survival sex, can sometimes be considered to be human trafficking, depending on who finds out about it and the context in which it happens. So those are some of the intersections and some of the really lots of different ways that people can be involved in sex work and the sex trade. Wow, and I think that you really just pointed out, and I know it's just, just like a, the tip of the iceberg, what you just talked about, mm -hmm. that it's really, really complicated. And I think one of the things that a lot of providers think about when they think about sex work or sex trade are things that are illegal and things that are only for money. Mm -hmm. So you've definitely talked about some things that are some legal ways that exchange money or goods for um, sexual acts or sexual services, and about uh, survival needs. And I think that's really, really important. Do you have anything else you'd like and to, to add? Say, people, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, do you want to add mean, any more about that? Well, I did want to just add also that sometimes what people might also not consider is the fact that there are so many people who are involved in the different kinds of support roles um, within sexual labor. So, for example, if uh, somebody's working at an exotic dance club, well, there's people who have to serve drinks and people who are the bouncers and the security and people who maybe drive individuals to different kinds of appointments or there's all different kinds of um, some some ways of being involved in sex work means that you're not actually exchanging sex for money you're just involved in kind of putting it all together and kind of managing things and putting things together so that's a part of sex work as well that's really great that's a good framework to start with um, can you talk a little bit about um, how trans communities are involved in sex work yeah I mean the thing is is that the Definitely for trans communities, it's everywhere, but it really does depend on specific regions. If you live in a city area, it's going to be different than if you live in a rural area. Um, if you live in, uh, it's definitely like, you know, in, in some cities, it's going to look a little bit different. In individual circumstances, it's going to look a little different. On occasion, trans individuals are working kind of like alongside cisgender sex workers. But um, what, many times, at least a lot of times that myself and a lot of individuals who have been working within like sex work communities have found is that trans individuals are working in specific areas with other trans individuals. And the trans community, I, I think what's important to mention is that the trans community involvement in sex work is often so uh, fetishized and specifically marketed in a very specific kind of way. So for example, if you look online and you're going to see individuals, then this is like a specific section in which people who are trans are going to be able to say like, well, this is where I'm going to find the clients who are looking for trans individuals. And that division is really known within like sex industry venues. So sometimes some of the things, and we may talk about this in a little bit, but many times clients and customers will claim, particularly when they commit serious acts of violence against trans sex workers, will claim not to know that somebody was trans. And we know that they're being untruthful because that's not where they would have actually found somebody. Like it would, they would have known that they would have actually gone to an area in which they knew that there were trans sex workers working. That makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the things that we tend to think about is that violence only occurs between people um, in the sex trade and their clients or promoters. Can you share more about how, um, how or who might be committing violence against trans individuals who are in the sex trade? Well, certainly clients and customers are a potential source and, and certainly have at times definitely committed acts of violence. And keep in mind that when we talk about like clients and customers, that that includes not just individuals who 
someone may have met just at one time, but is somebody might end up being like more of like a regular client or a regular customer, somebody who you've known for a while. Um, so there are individuals who you may have only met at one time, but somebody who you've known for a while, so you have this like ongoing connection to them. Um, but the reality is, is that a lot of the reports that we see of violence towards transsex workers are from police and from law enforcement. And that happens in a number of different ways. We're talking about the fact that sometimes there's a sexualized harassment and violence from, from police towards sex workers. And so I think that there are sometimes law enforcement who are specifically targeting trans sex workers um, out of that vulnerability and knowing that they can be able to um, use their and abuse their power to be able to take advantage of sex workers. Sometimes I think trans sex workers are also targeted um, by police specifically if you think about the kind of violence that just occurs through constant harassment, even if you're walking down the street and you're not necessarily working at that time, but by being targeted and by being specifically harassed by law enforcement no matter when you're out on the street. And so that can be part of the, the violence from police. But there's also just significant in the sense that police are sometimes targeting trans sex workers, more likely to arrest them, more likely to incarcerate them. So that's part of like a lot of um, violence of, of from police. But it's also about managers and promoters and individuals, whether or not they identify themselves as pimps, but individuals who are trying to exploit individuals who are involved in the sex trade sometimes are also responsible for the violence um, towards trans sex workers. And so when you think about, like, say, working inside a bar or working inside an environment where there's somebody who's, like, kind of, like, arranging it or, like, pulling together the kind of party, um, that there are times in, in in which trans sex workers have actually then again reported that those managers have committed violence or held them against their will or arranged for acts of violence to be committed against them. Like somebody else actually did it, but they know that it was the manager who actually set it up. What's really important to mention as well is that sometimes it's intimate partners of trans sex workers who may also be committing that violence. I mean, sometimes that, that intimate partnership might be your only source of connection and, um, and a source of love and amazing support, but sometimes that intimate partner may also be abusing and may also be using violence and power and control against trans sex workers. It, at times, it might mean that that individual is also involved, if you will, in other kinds of like illicit activity, and so there's kind of like a back and forth. But sometimes, particularly if that intimate partner is not involved in sex work, that they can also use that against a trans sex worker, against them, and as a part of that violence. And lastly, I think it's important to mention that sometimes both our biological as well as the chosen family of trans sex workers can also be responsible for potential acts of violence and the violence that then trans sex workers will report. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, when you're talking about, like, um, chosen family or, or community members, I, I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on how community members may actually be more violent or aggressive towards people in the trans community who do sex work because of mm -hmm. wanting to kind of maintain this this level of, oh, you know, we're, we're good people, we, we want to look normal in quotes, and if that might actually be increasing some of the violence within trans communities. I think that's certainly possible. I mean, when you think about the kind of incredible hostility that sometimes, again, trans activists are facing from both family members and, again, people who are either our biological family members, right, or chosen family members, but even community members, like, for example, when you think about, like, some of the sex work is happening on the street, right? And so the fact is, is that sometimes trans sex workers are actually targeted by community members for the kind of violence that I think maybe other folks don't necessarily even realize. And we're talking about the fact that sometimes just, and we're talking, when I'm saying community members, I'm talking about, like, neighborhood individuals who may, in fact, throw things at trans sex workers, um, throw throw coins, throw rocks, throw bottles um, at individuals who are like walking down the street um, in an attempt to harass and commit violence against them. So I think that that's a part of that community member harassment. But even when you think about like the internal kind of community harassment, the kind of outright um, judgments and dismissal, the fact of like individuals wanting to almost like erase the existence of trans sex workers. So the within sometimes like different kinds of community environments, you feel like um, 
individuals just be constantly putting down and saying like, well, that's not either, that's not really happening, or it's not really happening that much, or don't talk about that. We don't want people to know that you were involved in that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Fort Jockman talks about the dangers of labels and definitions, and we, we talk about this a lot using the terms paradox, which um, people who have been on other webinars are really familiar with. So I'm guessing that this kind of extends to talking about folks who are involved in the sex trade, so about how they identify, what labels they might use, how they define um, their identity or their behavior. Can you talk a little bit about what that might look like yeah. or mean? You know, it's really tough when you think about like the ways in which we might talk about issues around trading sex for money, gifts, drugs, or survival needs. A lot of times in, in the work that I do, oftentimes I'll use the term sex trade or use almost like a paragraph to try to describe all the different kinds of ways that someone can be involved in trading sex for money, gifts, drugs, or survival needs. I include like not just sex, right, but the idea of being sexual, sexual type stuff. Um, so the thing is, is that sometimes we might end up, whether it be in this webinar or other kinds of environments, um, use the shorthand of sex worker or use the shorthand of someone involved in the sex trade. But the reality is, is that people identify in all kinds of different ways. And so a trans sex worker might end up saying like, well, I'm a dancer. Um, and that's like, that's their primary identity, right? But they don't necessarily want to claim the term sex worker. Or somebody might end up saying like, well, um, you know, sometimes I end up doing some things for survival needs, but again, may not identify with that term of sex worker. So there's a lot of different ways in which sometimes it's more like field specific to sex work. So say, for example, somebody says, you know, I am, um, I work in porn, that's, you know, what I do, I'm an adult video performer, uh, talking about somebody who identifies as being a provider as being somebody who's within um, the adult entertainment industry. Somebody might identify themselves as being, um, uh, again, like this idea of like being a fetish worker and being very clear about the kind of terminology that they think is really important. So I think it's incredibly important for anyone who works within sex trade communities to ask somebody and find out, like, what's the word that you use? What's the term that you feel most comfortable with? And not making that assumption, because sometimes I've seen that some folks, and I understand why, I mean, the reality is that sex worker is obviously a much better term than maybe some of the other options that had come before it. And so it's a better term to say use than to automatically classify everything as being prostitution. Don't want yeah. um, that, partly because we've talked about the fact that obviously there's this range of involvement. Some of it is not necessarily illegal. It's also including legal sex work. And it's really important that we really honor the fact that there's lots of people involved in lots of different kinds of ways. So part of it is about asking and finding out what that is. Second of all, it's even offering some different kinds of options because it might be that somebody doesn't necessarily want to connect up with that word, but in a little bit then maybe that makes a little bit more sense after they've thought about it for a while. Um, but it's incredibly important that we not, not just use one specific label and think that that covers everybody. Um, because you're, you're going to run into somebody who just finds that that just that one particular word just doesn't work for me, and it's better to ask. Exactly, and I think that that's kind of a, a lead into the next question. But I think you know sometimes when providers use just that one word, if they mm -hmm. use prostitution or some of the the words that a lot of people find really offensive, that might stop that interaction, and and people may not end up getting service because they feel really dissed by the, the provider um, for a little bit of slang. So um, the next question I had for you was that um, trans people both in and out of uh, sex work, sex trade, um, any, any language that we want to use here, um, have frequently experienced judgment from providers. And they might be hesitant to seek the care that they need because of fear of additional judgment or discrimination or violence. Can you talk a little bit about what advocates and providers can do to help trans clients feel less or no judgment from helping providers? I think it's so very important because, for example, when I've had the opportunity and, and there have been times when, you know, I've just kind of put it out there, we're, we're having a conversation or having an individual conversation, um, particularly because my work is oftentimes with young people and so with a, a young trans person and I ask them and say, like, what do you think is so very important from anybody who's working to try to, like, assist individuals who are involved in the sex trade, what do you think is really important? Universally, everyone will say, people really need to stop being judgmental. The dilemma is, is that I think a lot of anti-violence advocates might think of themselves 
well, of course I'm not judgmental. Um, I, of course I would, like, not want to convey any kind of judgment. They might think to themselves, I'm already doing that. I, I, would, I would never, uh, you know, show any kind of judgment. But the reality is, is that anyone who's coming to be able to get assistance or services from a new place, the assumption, unfortunately, is going to be that you are judgmental. The, the assumption is, like, outright, um, because, unfortunately, so many other people are judgmental. So to me, I feel like it's really important for anybody who wants to be able to extend help that they need to be the first ones to bring it up themselves. They can't actually necessarily assume that that person is going to assume that you're, you're non-judgmental. So one of the ways that I think about that is that they need to bring up the subject first um, in the sense that, like, say, for example, if you're, like, around your office and, you know, you have, like, all these different kinds of things, you can find ways in which you're finding informational posters or other kinds of items that show you're open to talking about issues around the sex industry, you're open to talking about issues around the sex trade, the fact that you might feel more comfortable talking about sex in sexual-related terms. So, for example, if you for sure um, have information about condoms or condom-related information around those are ways in which you kind of show yourself um, to be open to sex and sexual related matters. That can be another way that, that you're giving kind of an idea that you're open to having that conversation. Another thing is that as it kind of comes out little bit by little bit, say for example someone's disclosing information and they're talking a little bit about that, again, it's important for individuals who are anti-violence advocates to actually go out of their way to be able to say like, I want to hear about this. And I um, I guess thinking about ways in which you can say, like, I've already encountered this in these kind of different ways. This is where my knowledge comes from. But I really want to learn what your understanding is and tell me more, and I'm, I'm open to learning about that. So being able to say that first, as opposed to just assuming that somebody's going to think that you are not judgmental, is important to do. That's really great. I think that so many providers really want some concrete things about what they can do because most providers really do want to help the people that are in their office. So do you have any other um, concrete examples? I know you kind of mentioned literally having things in your office that send signals to, to clients. What other kinds of things might help? You know, one of the challenges, and this is something that it's a question for people to figure out if it like works for them, because the dilemma is is that one of the ways that you can do that is, for example, changing some of the intake questions on your form. So, for example, you could end up asking questions on your intake form that opens up that conversation, like saying, for example, um, uh, a question like asking, have you ever been involved in trading sex or being sexual for money, gifts, drugs, or survival needs? Now, the challenge is that depending on what kind of a place that you work at, the question is, are you opening up that question because you can actually hold that information confidential, or perhaps for some anti-violence advocates, they find that if they ask that question and somebody says yes, that things become a bit more complicated. So it's a question mark to say that if it makes it possible for you to be able to change perhaps some of your intake forms, you could end up finding out this information much sooner. And the way that you ask that question, the idea that you would ask it in this non-judgmental way of talking about has that ever been your experience, a lot of people find that they actually do end up having to rely on trading sex for survival or as, as the option that they have. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that if that's been your experience? That can be a way to be able to open up that conversation. If not in the intake, then it's about thinking about other opportunities as you are working with that individual. So say, for example, maybe not an intake, but at a future date, particularly if you have an ongoing relationship with the client, to be able to bring up that topic and say, so this is experience for a number of the clients that I work with. This has been your experience, too, um, in order to be able to open up that conversation. And that can be another way that, again, you're showing that you're willing to talk about that and you're not actually having to wait until somebody brings it up. That's right. And it, that kind of leads us to questions around, like, what information is relevant or um, what do people do with the information? So sometimes when we know something about somebody, so if you ask those questions on an intake form, we might assume a lot of things about that if we don't have further conversations. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you could talk about, like, how can providers make information about sex work relevant when it is and put it aside when it's not? Yeah. I mean, here's the thing, we're all really complicated people. And so when you think about that, that um, if somebody who's a trans individual is involved in sex work and comes to you for assistance, 
there could, could be any number of different things that are going on for that individual, right? So it's possible that, say, for example, if somebody comes to you and they're talking to you about the violence within their relationship and with their intimate partner, that if you think about the idea that they're telling you about all these different kinds of experiences within their relationship, and one of the things that's a factor for them in their life is that they're also sex working. But that's not actually directly relevant to the kind of assistance that they might need, say, for example, with a restraining order, or the kind of assistance that they might need with seeking out shelter to be able to get away from an abusive partner. If that is not actually relevant at that time, I think it's important for people to kind of understand that that's like a, a part of that person, it's a part of what their experience is, but to not focus in on it. Sometimes I find that when um, different anti-violence advocates um, find out that information about sex work, they might have their own personal bias or opinions or their own concerns, and then they make that the issue, or they keep going back to that issue, even if that's not really what that individual has come, that individual has come to you for assistance for. So I think it's important to kind of know that information and then be able to push it aside when it's not important and focus in on the needs and the resources that someone is actually sitting in front of you and asking for. I think that's really important. However, it's also important to say that sometimes information, if you will, it's like I think that sometimes for, for some trans sex workers, it's almost like they'll get so used to the idea that discrimination and violence is so routine that it's almost like they're kind of expect you as an anti-violence advocate to not take it as seriously either. So they may not even present it as being that big of an issue. And it's okay sometimes, I think, for anti-violence workers to talking with trans sex workers to focus in and say, I think that's important. I don't think that you deserve that violence. What can we do and what can we talk about to be able to focus in on that? So I think it's kind of important to acknowledge when stigma and discrimination because of sex work is clouding whether it be like those different system, provi like system providers, all those different kinds of like whether it be law enforcement and clouding their judgment to be able to take a sex worker seriously um, in their reports of violence. So I think it's important to, at times, you're going to end up having to like kind of acknowledge when stigma and discrimination against sex work is real, and at times you're going to end up having to kind of push that aside when it's not the central focus. That's really great. So I think that a lot of times people really do need to just have that affirmation of, you know, I hear you and I think it's important. And sometimes it doesn't have to go farther than that, but just having that affirmation can really be bonding for the provider and the client. And then they can move on to whatever is really the pressing issue, which like you said could be about getting a restraining order or getting shelter or whatever their, their needs are. So that's great. Let's move on and talk a little bit about um, what happens when people end up being arrested um, and charged with a crime when they're actually the victim of a crime. Um, can you talk a little bit about what happens? And it's, it gets really complicated sometimes with, with who's the victim, who's the perpetrator, um, you know, how, how do things play out sometimes? Yeah. I mean, the dilemma is that one of the reasons, and there are many, many different reasons why trans sex workers may be reluctant to report crimes to law enforcement, is because, for example, when we take about the issue around sexual violence, so many law enforcement will um, not take those uh, not take those reports seriously. But even in being able to report the reality that you were sexually assaulted, um, you are you might end up finding yourself in a situation where you're in the descri describing the whole process you're actually talking about the fact that you were engaged in a crime while this crime happened to you. So everyone has the, the risk, if you will, of when reporting these crimes to law enforcement that they may arrest you based on the details of your report of your sexual assault, which has happened. They may actually also, law enforcement could potentially arrest you because you have a warrant, a previous warrant out for your arrest. Or they might decide to just completely dismiss and outright deny the fact that you're even reporting this sexual assault, but then come up with another kind of charge to be able to, again, also arrest and incarcerate a trans sex worker. So I think what's really, really deep is that sometimes, again, as advocates, um, whether it be as individuals, as programs, that there's such a heavy emphasis on when violence occurs that we're supposed to report it to law enforcement. 
And yet for trans sex workers, it's incredibly important to recognize that oftentimes there's such an incredible risk of law enforcement making that arrest in the process of making that report that I think advocates really need to take that seriously. And one of those ways that you can actually take that seriously is not only by being able to provide what is a level of legal advocacy, um, something that, that many of us are, are trained to do, but also recognizing at times that you what you actually really need is lawyer representation. Um, I think sometimes within, if you will, like within reporting crimes, uh, anti-violence advocates, sexual assault advocates, domestic violence um, advocates kind of get into this kind of routine where somebody is uh, reporting what's happening to them and never do they actually go far enough to think ahead that the unintended consequence might be that that victim is actually arrested for a crime. But because that is an actually distinct possibility for individuals who are, who are sex workers, I think it's really important to think, you know, what are the kind of resources we have to make sure that somebody has lawyer representation? And if they don't have lawyer representation at the time, then it's really important for them to be able to uh, support them in what are basic legal rights, which is being able to, like, not have to talk with law enforcement until they actually have uh, lawyer representation, right? Kind of like this idea of, I'm going to stay silent until I actually have a lawyer by my side. Because in the possibility of reporting that, you might end up, again, in a situation that was completely blown out to where now you actually have like a criminal case when what you were doing was trying to report a sexual assault. So I think it's really important to think about that possibility, but it's equally important to recognize and to support clients who do not want to report to law enforcement. Um, there's many different reasons, and sometimes you can do the absolute best possibility of saying, I will be there, I will support you, I will be your advocate, but for some individuals, the, the best and wisest decision for them, whether it be because of that fear of being arrested or because of another reason, it's just not the decision that they want to make. It's important for anti-violence advocates to support trans sex workers in deciding to not report to law enforcement and perhaps finding other kinds of more creative ways to be able to get the kinds of services and assistance that that trans sex worker needs without actually having to make that law enforcement report. Sometimes that can be a bit complicated. I'll give you an example within for example, with, uh, within what we talked a little bit earlier about within human trafficking. For example, if you are um, have migrated to the country and you are undocumented and you have been trafficked here, right? And if there is an individual who is uh, transgender, she undocumented, come to this country, trafficked in the country, and you report to a victim advocate that you have been trafficked. If at that time you end up reporting to, if, how can I say, in order to be able to get access to some of the necessary benefits that you might end up being able to qualify for as a trafficking victim, you have to report to law enforcement if you are over the age of 18. And you have to comply with law enforcement investigations in order to qualify for those, law, for those benefits that are available to trafficking victims. So, a lot of times, sometimes victim service providers will end up having to figure out other kinds of strategies because if somebody doesn't want to report to those law enforcement authorities or go along with criminal investigations, they're going to have to figure out other kinds of ways for them to be able to receive services because sometimes so many of our services, whether it be around trafficking or other kinds of anti-violence services, are connected to and dependent upon reporting to law enforcement. So the more that we can actually figure out ways creative ways for victims of crime to be able to get the kind of services they need without actually having to report to law enforcement. I think it's incredibly and crucially important at this point. And, and you bring up some really, really vital points because, you know, there's a lot of folks that do not want to report to, to law enforcement for lots of different reasons. And, um, I, you know, I think it challenges our systems to try to find creative ways. And I think that that's something that we all need to continue to think about. And, um, you know, that's not something that we can solve easily in an hour and a half webinar or even in multiple months or years worth. But I'm glad that you're bringing it up because I think that it's really important, not just for trans communities or sex work communities, but for lots and lots of communities that, that it's complicated. And it's very so. Yeah. So in talking about some of that complexity, can you talk a little bit more about the specific intersections and complications around trans communities and sex work? I know you've done that a lot already, but is there anything else that you'd like to add to that? You know, when you think about 
there's lots of, all these different kinds of push and pull factors about why any individual might end up involved in trading sex or sexual type things, selling sexual labor, um, and uh, being a part of sex work and being a sex worker. There's all these different kinds of push and pull factors that might lead somebody into sex work. And the reality is, is that because even when you just think about all of these different kinds of employment options, right, that, that again, a lot of anti-violence advocates might end up thinking as being options are. But the reality is, is that historically, sex work has been one of the only professions that considered itself to be open to transgender individuals. And so in some respects, there's been this like longstanding history where it kind of felt like, well, this is the place where I actually could be open. And I, um, you know, trans folks are talking about how like, this is where I could be me. This is where I could really express myself was within sex work and sex work communities. And so when you think about the fact that even just that, true enough, okay, across the country, we've, we've got these laws that say that employers are not supposed to use, um, I mean, they have, they have Recruiting discrimination based on gender identity, based on gender expression, and you know, even to think about the fact that we have these national laws that are protecting trans people. I think that the reality is is that many, many different like non-sex work. We think about mainstream employers are are, are able to, and they, and they still do basically discriminate against trans people within all of these different kind of mainstream non-sex work um, employment settings. So the reality is is that trans community many trans people in many, trans, in many communities are, are looking for other ways to be able to survive. And sex work within it, okay, true enough that there are some places within sex work where you have like legal environments, but in most parts of the sex trade, if you think about it, you're not going to have to fill out an application. You're not going to have to show any kind of ID. People are not going to ask you for references. Oftentimes they're not going to ask you for like where do you live. You don't necessarily have to have a consistent phone number. And you have an opportunity to be able to make the kind of money that is in the kind of money that in the kind of time that you won't be able to make in other kinds of professions. The kind of cash that you will not be able to see in a very short amount of time that you cannot make in other kinds of employment positions. So the reality is, is that sometimes individuals are actually um, not just involved, like they may have what is like a straight job during the day or in other parts, and they're also using sex work to supplement that. Or they may um, be on SSI, or they may be on other kinds of public benefits and are having sex work as kind of like a supplement to that. So that's another way in which people are kind of actually using it as more of like, if you will, like an addition to the other kind of income that they might have. Um, and even when you think about all the other kinds of expenses that my, somebody might have, so they might have some insurance, but it's not covering all of their health care needs. Or they may have no insurance. And so, again, the kind of access to the cash that you can actually make within sex work might be supplementing some of those health care needs. I think that that's incredibly important to think about because all of those different kinds of ways in which people might kind of be making money in, in, in informal kinds of ways, um, sex work is one of them. But there's other kinds of, like, if you will, when you think about like the informal economy or the underground economy in which individuals are kind of making money in those different kinds of ways. So you might end up having, uh, you know, having that ID or having that identification, but you know, maybe you don't want to necessarily like fully change over that identification or you don't want to change the ID. And when you think about the, the fact that um, even just I've been talking about this as being a reality for um, for individuals who might be U.S. citizens and don't have necessarily like you've lost your ID. But when you think about the fact that you have folks who are undocumented and may have find it really difficult to, to be able to secure any kind of even um, false identification, uh, I think that the reality is, is that it may be really, really difficult for somebody to be able to get other kinds of employment outside of sex work. So there's a lot of intersections and complications about why we're seeing such a, um, a strong correlation between trans communities and sex work. And a couple of things that I guess I want to go a little bit more into detail, too, about is that for so many trans sex workers who I've talked with, it set, like the sex work environment was like one of those places where you actually felt that somebody like actually like affirmed you for who you were and your the gender identity that you presented, the 
almost like feeling this kind of sense of like acceptance and the fact that people were willing to pay money and the fact that there was this kind of like sexual desire for you um, was amazingly affirming. And I guess I've talked to a lot of like anti-violence active advocates who don't understand that sex work isn't just simply about money. Sometimes it's also about feeling kind of like you're, I don't know, you're getting this kind of affirmation or feeling power or feeling empowered from it and thinking about all the different kinds of ways that you might be, um, all the different kinds of things that you might be getting involved for sex work. Is it, It's partly about money, but there's also other kinds of affirmations too. Um, the thing that I think has been talked about a little bit, but it's important to not underestimate it for like a minute, is that when you think about the high number of trans youth who are homeless, who are street-based, um, who are without consistent housing, and that can include in, in all these different kinds of ways, and youth who identify themselves as home-free, who don't want that kind of specific structure of being a home, but consider the streets in, in the waterways to be their home. And so when you think about the fact that there's a higher number of trans youth who are homeless, um, I think that it's really incredibly important. Again, when we think about like there's lots of different ways that you might be able to make money on the streets. But the reality is, is that sex work is definitely a part of that equation. And engaging in sex for money or even just, again, that informal kind of survival sex that we talk about happens both for transgender youth as well as transgender adults. It's really important to not overlook that because, I mean, if you talk to somebody who's like 30 or, or 40, you don't stop having those kind of survival needs sometimes. And so when we think about the idea that we have trans folks who are involved in survival sex across the age spectrum. And that's a reality. And some of those are happening, again, not just with strangers, but within intimate partnerships so that the reason why you're with that person isn't necessarily because it's the, the relationship that you know is best for you, but because that person is providing for you and there's no other really best resource for you um, in that kind of way. So it's really kind of seen as being more of like an asexual, a sexual exchange. So there's, those are just some of the kind of intersections and complications that we could talk about. That's really good. And I think it's really interesting to hear what's kind of, what's not, I don't want to say different about, trans people's experience in sex work, but, you know, kind of the unique things that that trans people may uh, get out of it or how trans people approach um, their work in the sex sex trade industry. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you could talk just for a few minutes about what are some of the things that are the same, so things that kind of cross any kind of population that, that's engaged in sex work. Well, I think there's a couple of really important shared issues, if you will, shared experiences. And the first, um, if you will, struggle, complication, uh, really serious issue that, that is facing community sex work communities is criminalization. So the reality is that across the U.S., um, in, in most of the U.S., outside of rural, um, just some rural counties in, in Nevada, um, prostitution, the exchange of sex for money, is largely considered to be illegal. It's criminalized in lots and lots of different kinds of ways, in lots of different kinds of, um, there's different kinds of experiences. So say, for example, in some communities, it's considered to be something in which a lot of folks get ticketed for, so you get all these different kinds of fines. Some individuals are actually receiving what are state charges, and so you see lots and lots of, for example, very aggressive law enforcement sweeps um, where uh, law enforcement will kind of focus their efforts on certain kind of like locations or certain areas and make hundreds of arrests, for example, within, uh, you know, particularly in some urban areas within just a several week basis, and you have hundreds and hundreds of arrests. And in every, again, all of the different kinds of research, um, while we know that transgender communities are definitely being targeted for unequal law enforcement in the sense that they are most definitely experiencing um, a, a higher number of arrests, Certainly, sex workers of, of all gender identities are experiencing those high level of arrests and share those concerns around criminalization and the way that it um, unfortunately forces sex workers to not, you know, like it forces them away from resources, it forces them away from being able to get assistance, away from being able to be open about their lives and open about the experiences because of fear of arrest. There's lots of other kinds of consequences, again, of criminalization. Sometimes that can even include, say, for example, individuals 
and the kind of criminal background checks that people complete so that kind of criminal history can follow you around. That's definitely a shared experience of criminalization. The other struggle that sex work communities across the country are experiencing is really talking about the fact that and this is something that like, we knew was going on for a very long time, but it feels like just really relatively recently are we seeing a more concerted campaign, a more concerted conversation about this issue, is the fact that while we have lots and lots of public health and lots and lots of different kinds of programs that are handing out condoms to be able to uh, reduce the transmission of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections, um, unfortunately, law enforcement across the country has a practice of confiscating condoms of sex workers. That can happen a number of different ways. It can happen because as law enforcement might engage or have conversations with sex workers, they might then just take, even if they don't arrest them, they might end up just like, taking those condoms. They might end up like poking holes in those condoms, just being really mean and dismissive or, you know, throwing them out. Or sometimes condoms are actually used, if you will, as evidence of prostitution. So on your ticket or on that charge, you'll actually see where they'll list and say, this individual was found with what they'll refer to as too many condoms. Um, and let me just be clear for anybody watching this, <laughs> uh, which is that there is no law on the books across the U.S. that says that it's illegal to carry condoms. Like there is no law for sure across the country that says it's illegal to carry too many condoms. There's no quantity. It's never okay. There's no law that you would be breaking. Um, however, sex, work, sex workers and anyone involved in the sex trade across the country, many people doing outreach know that individuals actually truly believe that it's illegal at this point to carry condoms because they have been hassled, arrested, and criminalized for carrying those condoms so often that people somehow actually believe that that, that that law, that there is actually a law like that. So right now, um, that's something that a lot of sex work communities are actually organizing to be able to, um, to again, in order to protect the health um, of, of everybody and of all of our community members, it's important that sex workers, sex workers be able to carry condoms. And unfortunately, we're having a lot of struggles with that. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely hear that. I know some of the questions that we were going to go into next, I think we've really covered a lot of, which were you know, some of the specific challenges for trans folks um, and what providers can do. So I'd like to move um, next to what are some opportunities for sex worker-specific advocacy with trans clients? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about you know, that? Here you go. The thing is, is that when you think about, again, there's a lot of reasons why individuals who are involved in sex trade might be sitting in front of you as an anti-violence advocate. And so sometimes that person might have actually like sought you out because they realize that you have that assistance to be able to get them into that shelter. You have that assistance to be able to get them to kind of like that very specific direct resource that you have access to. But if you think of yourself like, okay, I have this relationship with this client and um, you know, we've had this open conversation, and so they're, they're sharing and they're open with me about some of the struggles that they might be experiencing um, as a trans sex worker. I think that there's actually a lot of opportunities, and one of the things that I would really encourage a lot of anti-violence advocates to pursue is information about different kinds of harm reduction options and really respecting individuals' decisions about their work. And when I say harm reduction, um, some of us are familiar with this practice and philosophy, and I can reduce it to one very simple phrase, which is assisting people in any positive change as they define it. What that means is that while an individual sex worker might sit in front of you and this person, you might think about all the different kind of complications and all of the amazing uh, qualities about themselves, right? There's all kinds of different things going on for them. And some of the things are challenges and some of the things are actually amazing qualities about them. and when you think about all the different kinds of complications they might bring, sometimes, again, advocates might come at it and might think like, well, if that's a challenge, then you should just stop. Uh, if you're, you know, if, if sex work is causing you any kind of problems, that the first thing you need to do is to figure out how to exit, and that's the first thing you need to focus in on. But that's not necessarily the first thing that people need to, ex need to actually focus in on. Exit is a possibility, and that might be something that somebody might be considering. 
but harm reduction uh, teaches us that it's really important to think about all the different kinds of ways that somebody might make some positive small changes that would make a benefit. And I'll give you a few examples of that. Say, for example, um, when we think about the idea that uh, because sex work is oftentimes something in which uh, somebody's not necessarily, it's not like an official type workplace and giving you like an official work schedule, right? Like you work from 9 to 5 or you work from 10 to 6. Um, so sometimes individuals who are involved in sex work, I think that you end up like always trying to, like the schedule just gets out of control and so it's like, you're always figuring out, like, when can I make more money? Or if I'm, like, not online now, I'm probably losing money. And so sometimes, like, that just, you're, like, consistently always thinking, like, when can I make that, when can I make that next appointment? And um, not actually giving yourself some time to breathe. So one of the ideas, for, for example, sex worker-specific advocacy um, might be to help a trans client come up with, for example, like, a, a kind of schedule of saying, okay, so these are the days that I'm going to work, and these are the days that I'm not going to work. Um, it can be as basic as that. Another, for example, sex worker-specific advocacy might be that, for example, a trans client who is finding that working in one specific environment, say, for example, a, a specific club where they feel particularly disrespected, might find that if they transfer to, say, another kind of field of sex work, so say, for example, uh, doing as opposed to that kind of club or an in-person kind of environment, switching to doing, say, for example, webcam shows, something in which they don't have direct contact with the client or customer, might actually work out better for them. So those are some things that I think are really important to, uh, to consider because even if someone says, like, well, perhaps another day I might actually consider exiting or I might consider, like, I, want, I don't want to do this at that point, um, there's lots and lots of different options for being able to support someone's health and their wellness and their safety while they're currently involved in trading sex for money. And I think that that's really important. One of the tools that um, I know that you'll uh, be providing later on with some of the resources, but for example, I work here in Milwaukee and like many communities uh, across the U.S. as well as in other communities, um, we've started a bad date sheet here. And a bad date sheet is an opportunity for individuals um, of all gender identities who uh, have experienced violence from clients who do not want to report police, report to police, or who, in addition to reporting police, also want to report to other community members who are involved in sex work about violent customers, clients, dates, johns. Again, there's lots of different right hobbyist clients. There, there's all these different kinds of terms or words, but the individuals who are paying for sex sometimes they're committing violence. We also take reports of talking about violence from police or managers or promoters, when we think about all the different people who might commit violence, we want to be able to share that information because other trans sex workers might have actually encountered that individual, and if you could tell them about what car to look out for or what house to not go to, I think that's something in which, first of all, it's a really powerful tool, right, to be able to share those experiences within community. It's also about building sex worker communities so that instead of, say, for example, um, you might have conversations with trans sex workers who report feeling like this intense competition between each other. Well, Bad Date Sheet is about sharing information with each other and protecting each other and being able to build community with each other. So that's a really powerful community building tool. Because one of the things that's really incredibly important, and you're going to hear this again and again when you think about any kind of sex worker specific advocacy with trans clients, is that individuals want to hear from their peers. They want to hear from individuals who share that experience, whether it be the experience of being transgender or especially the experience of both being transgender as well as being a sex worker. The more that we can actually um, increase those opportunities for peer-based advocacy where individuals with life experience actually get to advocate and do that peer outreach, I think it's critically important. So when you're doing that kind of advocacy, no matter where you're at, and let's just say you look around in your community and you think like, that's just not here around the community, well, then I would really encourage you to start looking around resources around the country so that you can be able to connect up individuals with that kind of trans-specific sex worker advocacy that does exist so that somebody can feel that they're talking with someone who is from their own experience. It's something that again and again we keep hearing about that. Um, I guess, I, you know, I also want to put it out here too, is like one of the things that I find is that a lot of times folks will 
almost like kind of adapt to the situation. And in some respects, that can be a really powerful thing. Like, say, for example, we were talking about the reality of law enforcement taking condoms away, both from transgender sex workers as well as sex workers of all different gender identities. Um, and sometimes one of the things that people do is they'll just say, well, I guess we'll just hand out more condoms or we'll be open more often or we'll try to figure out, you know, ways to, like, kind of hide them. And, and those are all important strategies to kind of consider. But at times we also just really need to support reporting law enforcement who abuse their power and to confront some of our system partners. I mean, the reality is, is that sometimes we have these kind of opportunities where we can learn from each other, but sometimes we also have to challenge each other and challenge those different system partners to say, you know what, that's not okay. We've been hearing all of these different reports of, you know, say, for example, you've been hearing lots and lots of different reports of police harassment of trans sex workers on one particular street or in one particular area. Well, let's start drilling down on that and finding out who are those law enforcement? Are those detectives? You might want to think, like, hmm, maybe that's, specifically detectives who are investigating prostitution, maybe it's not. Maybe it's actually like your more beat-level officers, your district-level officers who haven't gotten that kind of specialized training and um, competency training, and there's a lot of opportunity there for being able to educate and inform those individuals. So it's important sometimes that we need to start asking questions about how we actually change our systems and not just kind of get used to the way things are. Definitely. I love your um, definition, by the way, of, of harm reduction, and that's just a, that's a perfect way to, to talk about what harm reduction is. It's a very simple way and, and very poignant. Um, and I also think that it's, it's really important that you were sharing like, how sometimes people get more from their peers. So these peer-to-peer -peer websites, peer-to-peer -peer reporting sheets are sometimes probably even more valuable to, to people than the official ones that's in quotes of, of websites that are, are made by people outside of the community. Um, I'm wondering, we have a few minutes left, if you could share a little bit about um, any of the resources. We're going to go through some resources that you shared with us um, after we're done talking, but if you wanted to highlight any of the resources that you think are especially important for people to uh, be familiar with. Definitely, definitely. You know, I think that there's so many, and I, um, I definitely want to make mention that, if again, if you're thinking to yourself, like, where would I find some of this information? Um, we actually, the, the National Sex Worker Outreach Project, as you know, might see it, like an acronym of SWOP, um, S-W-O-P, um, has chapters all across the country. So even if you don't necessarily have one right there in your own community, you can be able to contact some of those individuals. But there are actually also some really amazing projects that we have all across the country, and I can mention a few. And again, you can definitely follow up with some more information. I mean, the St. James Infirmary in San Francisco is this amazing health clinic that's actually, again, run by and, and, by and for um, commercial sex workers in the San Francisco and Bay Area and California area and has amazing resources not only there locally but also online to be able to look for information. When we think about, say, for example, I've mentioned earlier, much earlier, um, the organization HIPS in Washington, D.C. that also has um, amazing information that's available on their website as well as information that they would be more than happy to talk with you about to share about that transgender specific sex worker positive advocacy. I think that that's really powerful. And I'll also make mention that there are a number of amazing youth projects and some of which um, you'll get some highlights here today when you think about, say, for example, um, research that's being done that uh, is specific to, um, to trans youth and the kind of organizing that's happening um, that's inclusive. And so, say, for example, I'm thinking of projects like Fierce in New York City that's LGBTQ um, youth of color who are organizing and including sex work issues as a part of that organizing. Or when I think about the Young Women's Empowerment Project in Chicago and the research that is youth-led research, and again, in their research of uh, talking about the kind of um, systemic inequalities in which youth in the sex trade and 20 percent um, I mean, there's so many different figures. I would encourage you to take a look at that research, but inclusive of uh, the experiences of transgender and genderqueer youth and their experiences of sex work. Uh, again, talking about all those different kinds of experiences, youth projects are really in the forefront of leadership on this, and so I would really encourage you to take a look at some of those different resources. 
in addition, when we, we talk a little bit about harm reduction, if you take a look at the Harm Reduction Coalition's website, you'll find amazing information, again, about sex worker-specific and trans-specific harm reduction advocacy, which I think, I mean, it just connects up so well with anti-violence advocacy. So, I mean, there's this kind of like intersection right there about some of the work that we do that I feel like when you think about safety planning, when you think about the kind of work that we do around all of the anti-violence reports, it is about, um, it's a form of harm reduction. And so I like to kind of bridge those gaps between some of the different kinds of work and the different kinds of philosophies, and I think it's definitely a natural fit. But I would also really encourage anti-violence advocates, and when we think about those different kinds of resources, um, to really be thinking about uh, what ways that they can actually be utilizing the multidisciplinary and the system partnerships um, to be able to, uh, again, push this and talk a little bit more about the experiences that are specific to trans folks in the sex trade. Because I guess I feel like if you, it's almost like if you create a situation that is better for the most vulnerable of communities, everyone's going to benefit. So sometimes people, like, they have a hard time focusing in on what they consider to be what are incredibly, really difficult and complicated situations. But in my thinking is, and through all of these different kinds of resources, if you focus in on some of the really, really complicated experiences and make those experiences easier, then we know that everybody benefits. It's like the most vulnerable people benefit, and everybody with all kinds of kind of complicated situations benefit. Wow, that's a great place for us to end. Um, you've shared so much information, and I know that it's going to take a lot of people a lot of time to just kind of integrate all of what you said, and I'm really glad that um, we're recording so that people can, can listen to it again if they'd like to, because there's just so much that I think we don't know, even those of us who know a lot, we don't know. So thank you very much for sharing your, your wealth of information. And um, if people would like to contact you, can... You know, can they do that by email? Most definitely, most definitely. And we'll make sure that that, that information um, with, with, with my email is available. Um, and I would also really encourage and say that this is opening up that conversation. Uh, while I'm able to kind of communicate a few thoughts, um, the reality is, is that there's a lot of really complicated situations. And so it's about starting that conversation and then keeping up the conversation. Exactly. Well, thank you very much again for your time today, and um, we'll talk soon. Thanks. Thank you. All right. I clearly have, this is Michael Munson again, and I, I clearly miscalculated our time a little bit, and I know that we have about one minute left. And I want to say that we really, really welcome your questions, and I know we don't have time to do that right now. Um, when we close the webinar today, you'll receive a survey, and it has an option in there for you to ask questions. And again, we'd really like to hear them, and we'd like to pass them along to Claudine for her to respond to those directly, or if we can address them, we would like to do that as well. So I'd like to just um, remind folks again that we will be sending out the PowerPoints, so all of the PowerPoints that went through today. Um, the recording will be up on the website either later today or by tomorrow. You'll receive an email that will let you know where that is. And again, you know, we do really encourage your questions, and we want to hear from what was valuable to you, what questions you have about providing services for folks. Um, a couple of, of wrap-up things are that um, we have three webinars coming up. We, we're doing them monthly. The next webinar is on December 13th, which is a Trans 101 webinar, so it's a repeat of, of the webinar that we've done before, on Trans 101. And then in January, we move back to more violence-specific things. We'll be talking about safety planning on January 10th. And then on February 14th, we'll have a webinar on creating trans welcoming environments. So I want to thank everybody for being here today, and um, we really appreciate your commitment to transgender survivors and, and your commitment to this, this issue. So thank you for, for being here today.